we do have a, a great program. Um, Senator Duckworth, uh, she noticed that we're making some of these changes uh, here at City Club, and she wanted to have a, a conversation in lieu of a, of a formal speech, which we very much welcome. Uh, today, she's going to be talking with Dan Seals, who is the CEO of Intersect Illinois. Uh, it's a public-private partnership, many of you are aware of, that's focused on global business development for the state, for the, the state of Illinois. Uh, Dan, would you please join me on stage, and we'll, uh, and we'll introduce the, uh, the senator. So please welcome Dan Seals. Thank you. Oh, U.S. Senator Tammy Duckworth is an amazing woman. We all know that. She's an Iraq War veteran. She's a Purple Heart recipient a member of the Senate Foreign Relations and Armed Services Committee, and a mother, which is my favorite. As a member of these committees, she's focused her work on strengthening relationships, both military and, and economic, with our partners and allies abroad, and has led several con congressional delegation visits to Asian nations in the recent years. She joins us today, she's gonna to tackle a whole host of issues, um, but she really does wanna talk about those trips in particular and our international relationships and, and, and how they're beneficial, not just for us and our partners, uh, but for the nation and, and the state of Illinois as well. Um, so please join me in welcoming a, a real American hero, uh, Senator Tammy Duckworth. Thank you. Hello, hello. Oh, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Senator, does that ever get old? <laughs> well, the more you stand and clap, the less time we have to talk, and oh, I want to talk, so. <laughs> and we've got a thank you. lot to talk about. Uh, Dan, thank you for that introduction, and, and thanks yeah. to everyone for having us here. Um, Senator, as you know, there has been uh, growing interest in sort of an isolationist view uh, mm -hmm. in the nation's capital and around the country. Um, I think there are some quarters where folks think that uh, foreign relations don't have an impact uh, on our lives here in Illinois for regular folks. So um, it's great that you are an expert in both foreign relations and, of course, the livelihoods of folks here in Illinois. And so I wanted to explore that theme a little bit with some of the trips you've been taking. Um, I know uh, as a member of the Armed Services Committee and the Foreign Relations Committee, um, you've been taking trips around the world, I mean, we could list them off, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, Philippines, Thailand, the list goes on and on. What are you saying when you're going on these trips? What's your message about Illinois? Yeah. Well, on the trips, I'm trying to grow and engage with America's soft powers overseas. And what we're seeing recently with um, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the world watching us standing up and really pulling together uh, our European allies, the Asian nations are taking uh, notice and they're watching to see what we do with Ukraine because they of course are dealing with the PRC and in particular Taiwan. So they're very anxious and they are um, starting to turn back to the US and there's an opening for us to really reinvigorate old relationships. Um, and so I'm trying to build on that in terms of my role on the Armed Services Committee but really bring forward my role on the Commerce Committee and engage um, uh, in terms of business relationships uh, uh, with folks. And so I tell them don't overlook the US as a place for great investments and let's take advantage of the Chips and Science Act that we just passed, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is really reinvigorating um, manufacturing in the US. The, all of these corporations overseas are looking to to, uh, to go someplace in the US. Um, in fact, uh, the previous president of South Korea had made a commitment to make $38 billion in manufacturing investments in the United States. Well, that money has to go somewhere, and why not Illinois? So it's been really for me to really push uh, and, and elevate Illinois as an option, because um, for far too long, especially Asian corporations mm -hmm. look to everywhere but Illinois. They either look to California, um, or they look to the southern states. And really, it's been about selling Illinois strengths um, and, and, and showing that we have a competitive advantage here. So 
that's your message out. What are you hearing back? What sorts of comments or reactions are you getting? So the reactions that I'm getting are, um, it's very interesting. Uh, when I tell them about our strengths, I talk about our infrastructure in terms of us being logistically uh, the center of the country. All seven class one railroads come through Illinois. Uh, we have, you know, one of the world's busiest airports in O'Hare, but we also have a, a, a parcel cargo hub in Rockford. And then we have, of course, in St. Louis. Uh, um, I talk to them about the Mississippi River um, being a major shipping route. Um, uh, I talk to them about Illinois being a big energy state. And what I hear back is, really? What I'm getting from all of these corporations is that we have not sold ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have not marketed ourselves enough, and we are not our biggest cheerleaders out there, and there's nobody cheerleading for Illinois. Um, and so it's been really, really um, exciting to be able to take on that role along with Governor Pritzker and his team. And you went on some of these trips with me as well um, to really extol uh, uh, all the things that are here in Illinois. And, and we're opening eyes. So actually, that's a great lead in. So these CODELs, I'm not sure that folks know. I they're rather intense, if you ask me. Yes. Could, could you kind of talk about what they are? You only went to like a third of the meetings I took when we went on this note. Um, so it's a CODEL is a congressional congressional delegation, CODEL. Um, and members of Congress can go on these. They tend to be military and armed services related. They tend to be go visit our troops in uh, uh, you know, in, in, in Iraq or Afghanistan. Or if you go and you're traveling around, it's very much you're, mi you're meeting with ministers of foreign uh, of defense and the like. And they're much less um, a one where you are promoting commerce in your own state. And But I've, I've decided to do just that, which is take advantage of the fact that, because I sit on both armed services, I sit on just the perfect three committees to do this. Because I sit on foreign relations, um, I can do the, the that, that diplomatic engagement. But because I sit on commerce, I pull in the commerce side of things. Um, and they are very intense. Usually we fly overnight, we land um, seven in the morning and we just go into a full day of meetings. Uh, we've met with, we always meet with government ministers. When I was in the Philippines in August, I sat down and had a private meeting for an hour with President Marcos. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and then I always make sure I meet with AmCham, the, the American Chambers of Commerce in each of those countries. I sit down with business leaders and then I pick uh, some of the top um, uh, multinationals. So I go to um, Samsung's headquarters. I s had private meetings with the SK, uh, 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 the president of SK, um, LG. Mm -hmm. You know, we take a lot, and you were in with me with a lot of those where we're addressing the opportunities for investments in Illinois because they're looking to come to the US. But we got to get them focused on coming to the Illinois as opposed to going to Georgia or Texas, which is where they've always gone. So these don't sound like junkets or boondoggles. <laughs> <laughs> They're not, but I do get a lot of really good local food while I'm there. So that's, that's my one thing. It's like, you know, don't feed me like a four-star restaurant. Let's go get some street food. That's my, that's my. Uh... Well, so you mentioned uh, SK and, and Samsung. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking about Samsung and, and energy reliability being something that's really important to them. Can you share a little bit of, of that? Story that yeah, so this has been an ongoing conversation that I've had now with these companies over a series of several years um, since before COVID. I, prior to COVID, I went to uh, South Korea and I sat down with both Samsung CEO and also and the head of SK actually hosted for me. And this was right after the Texas grid went down. And I was talking to them and I said, what are some of your concerns with the US? And, and the CEO of Samsung said, was bemoaning to me they said, did you know the Texas grid isn't part of the United States grid? And I said, yes, I do know that. <laughs> I said, did you not know that when you decided to build factories in Texas? He goes, no, we didn't know that. We just assumed that it's Texas, it's oil, that there would be energy. And he said to me, this was 2019, he said, we're losing $135 million a day. That's what they lost while the Texas grid was down, $135 million a day. I said, well, if you want, if you want stable energy, come to Illinois. So this was in 2019. Um, our grid is not going to go down. In fact, we're a net exporter of energy to other states around us. And I said, and now, in my latest trips post-COVID, um, it's been about a, a green energy alternative. Because today, if you come to Illinois, um, in some parts of Illinois, we can provide you with net carbon neutral energy packages. 
And with the work that's being done in um, uh, Indicator with uh, ADM and the work that's being done in Hennepin, Illinois with Marquis Energy, where they've sunk the first carbon capture sequestration well, our ethanol production will be net carbon negative in two years. So if you take ethanol, produce in Illinois, and you put in your gas tank, you're pulling carbon out of the air. This is very attractive to the Samsungs and the LGs mm. and the SKs because these companies, like their governments, have made a, a, a commitment to be net carbon neutral by a certain date and time. So they're looking, where do we go to offset our dirtier operations in India or Brazil? Where do we go? And I say, come to Illinois. That's how we got LG to move into Decatur, was I said, come to Decatur, and they now are uh, building a factory in Decatur because they can offset their carbon footprint just by being here in Illinois. Because we have 42% of our power is nuclear, and then we have the biofuel industry. The stuff that United is doing with um, sustainable aviation fuel is really leading globally on that. And then you've got, of course, um, All Nippon Airlines, which is in partnership with United, they've committed to becoming, to using 100% sustainable aviation fuel. So we're in a unique position. We've got to sell our strength as an energy state um, that rivals, if not actually surpasses places like Texas, where it is still uh, not, a, not a green energy alternative for the future. Uh, and it's worth mentioning that LG Chem investment, that's hundreds of millions of dollars that they're investing in Decatur. So that, that's a really big deal. That's a big deal, yeah. yeah. You mentioned uh, SK as well and sort of their need for a talent pipeline. Mm -hmm. What was that conversation? So in the same conversation with SK and Samsung, and then um, they both said the same thing about their operations, SK in Georgia and um, Samsung in Texas, they said they cannot get enough engineers and, and, and technically trained lay people. So people to work the factory floor that are technical, technically savvy, uh, a trained workforce. They can't get enough of them, but in particular, they could not get enough engineers. And they were having to pay a very high incentive rate to get Korean, engineers to agree to relocate to Texas or to Georgia. And I said, wouldn't you rather come to Illinois? Um, by the way, you know, uh, uh, five flights a day, uh, 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 daily flight direct to Seoul from O'Hare. And if you go outside into the suburbs a little bit, there are entire Korean American communities with Korean language schools for your kids to go to so that your kids are not gonna fall behind. I said, the quality of living here is one that is really much more competitive and far, by far out, out surpasses places like Atlanta and, and other places around the country. And this is, this is why Illinois, we're, we're like, you might know this, hmm. we're the third largest corporate headquarters yeah, location. Yeah, 33 in the, Fortune 500 companies. Yeah, right, and why, why are they coming in? Because the quality of life for their leadership is the best here. Um, and then I said, and you want engineers, U of I graduates more engineers every year than Caltech, MIT, Stanford. and Stanford combined. And we don't, but we don't sell that. We're so used, here's, the, here's something we could do better. We're so used to sending our talent that we train here outside of the state that we forget to claim them as our own. And I mean, the head of SK studied for his PhD at U of I of Chicago. The, the leaders of Panasonic that I sat mm -hmm. down with and, and, and Samsung that I sat down with, you know, these, these very senior VPs yeah. uh, all got their degrees either at U of I Chicago, Northwestern, uh, uh, U of I in, uh, you know, in Champaign or SIU. And they all had, they spoke so fondly of their time here. I'm like, so why are you not relocating your factories here? <laughs> you know about our engineering program. This is where you got your engineering degree. Why are you not coming here? You mentioned um, several trips. You've mentioned Taiwan. You've mentioned South Korea. Why Asia? Why is this taking such prominence in your travels? It's two prong. Um, one is uh, on the military national security side. We need to grow better our relationships with uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, because our greatest near peer competitor is the PRC is expanding in the region. And we really took our eyes off the ball there. Um, the other is opportunity, um, because in these countries, in particular the three, South Korea, Taiwan, um, and Japan, those corporations are hungry and they're looking to go, and they've made commitments, like South Korea making that $38 billion commitment um, uh, to President Biden. That money is coming here. It's gonna go someplace, 
let's make sure it comes to Illinois. So, so I, and, and, and especially in those countries, um, you have to grow these relationships. So because I've been going since 2018, 2019, when you came with me and spoke fluent Japanese in our meeting, it like, you know, opened their eyes and they said, oh wow, you know, the head of the concierge service for bringing businesses to Illinois actually is a Japanese speaker and studied here. Um, these are all part of how we attract folks. And so it is, I do keep going back. This latest trip was to the Philippines, Indonesia, and Thailand. That's where some of the manufacturing for the American logistical supply chain and manufacturing supply chain is gonna have to happen. We can't manufacture everything here, but we can manufacture low tech chips for the auto parts industry for those manufacturers here in Illinois. Mm -hmm. And we need to reestablish those, those supply lines. Yeah, supply chains are a big deal and a big advantage for uh, Illinois. So I heard a story, I wanted to confirm this is true. This is about your trip to Taiwan. Um, I understand when you arrived, it was in a military aircraft and the PRC was not very happy that you arrived in a military aircraft. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I may or may not be banned from the PRC, I'm not sure. <laughs> so at the height of the COVID pandemic, when, every, when the vaccines first started coming out, and everybody was trying to find vaccines. The uh, uh, Taiwan was trying to buy vaccines, but they were blockaded by the PRC. They were the only country in the world that got blockaded from the vaccines. Um, and what the PRC was doing was going and telling AstraZeneca and some of these other non-American firm um, companies, do not sell to Taiwan or we will not buy from you, using the might of the, of the, of the PRC government. Um, and so Taiwan, even though they had their own funds and were trying to buy vaccines for their own people, couldn't find anybody to sell the vaccine to them. So I went to, um, so it was me and Senator Dan Sullivan, a Republican from Alaska, um, who actually served during the last conflict in the Taiwan Straits on an aircraft carrier, he's a Marine. Um, uh, uh, we got along great because we just like drop F-bombs and we talk to each other all day long. <laughs> oh, there's kids there, oops, sorry. Um, but uh, he's a Marine, I'm a soldier, we get along great. But he and I started talking with Chris Coons and we're like, you know, this was before we started vaccine diplomacy. And, the, and we, said to, we went to the White House and said, there's only one nation being blockaded from the vaccine. If you're gonna start vaccine diplomacy, the first nation that we donate vaccines to should be Taiwan. Should be the only one that's currently being blockaded. And um, President Biden agreed. It, it was a bit of a, a campaign. Um, uh, at the time, it was complete lockdown everywhere. We flew into South Korea, um, commercial, and then we had to drive to the uh, ba military base and not tell the South Korean government what we were doing so that they would have plausible deniability. Uh, and then we, at four in the morning, got on a military aircraft and flew into Taiwan, and it was a C-17, um, uh, uh, the largest military airplane uh, that you could have that is used to transport things like M1 Abrams tanks inside of it. You know, If you see pictures of these uh, aircraft that will uh, drop a, a tank out of it with a parachute, that's what we, we arrived in. Um, we were just trying to get to Taiwan really quickly, uh, and that was the fastest way to get there. Um, and I knew General Abrams from my time at the VA um, uh, and, and General Abrams, I'll get you a C-17. You'll, 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 go, you'll go that way. We created an international incident because, <laughs> and we landed, we couldn't get to leave the airport. We announced that America was standing by Taiwan, yeah. announced the first vaccine donation um, in the world and, um, and uh, uh, there are pictures of our aircraft coming in, but we did, because the Chinese are, you're threatening us, you're, you know, this is what you would use to transport military equipment in the case of an invasion or a war, um, and yeah. But we gained a lot of support for Illinois in Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> that was like a great way to build a relationship. And now when I go back, I get to meet with, you know, Taiwan semiconductors and I get, you know, I, I, I have an open door to go there and all the soup dumplings I can eat. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I want to dig into that a little bit more. I mean, why is it important to show up for Taiwan? Why does that relationship matter so much? Because Taiwan is critical to the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, uh, over 30 percent of cargo of, of car shipping containers travel through the Taiwan Straits. And the rest of Asia is looking to see what we do for Taiwan. Uh, we're going to keep our word and stand by them. Um, and, 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 and that's why they're looking to uh, Ukraine and what we're doing there. Um, that freedom of navigation in Taiwan Straits is critical, not just for, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, 
political power against political power. It's, it's important for commerce and it's important for economic stability. And the fact that Taiwan Semiconductors at one point produced 95% of the high-tech chips that we use here in the U.S. is also critical. And so we're trying to attract Taiwan Semiconductors to come. Uh, they're looking to, uh, they made a commitment to build some factories. I'm trying to get them to come to Illinois because they're in Arizona. And I, Arizona is great, but one of the things you need for high-tech chip manufacturing is a lot of water. And I was like, how's that working out for you in Arizona, Taiwan <laughs> Semiconductors? They're like, yeah, it's one of our problems we have is we need a lot of purified water. There's some water issues in Arizona. I'm like, did you not know this? <laughs> like, let me show you a map of where Illinois is and this whole thing, thing called Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes. And by the way, we have two purified water manufacturing uh, uh, facilities in Southern Illinois. So, yeah. Well, so let's, let's keep on that, that CHIPS topic. You were part of the coalition that founded Innovate Illinois, which is about bringing down federal subsidies, uh, helping Illinois to get more than its fair share. Yes. Um, because there are uh, laws like the CHIPS Act, um, the Inflation Reduction Act, which provides strong incentives to bring that manufacturing here. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about how these TRIPS and that legislation and Innovate Illinois all sort of come together? When it all comes together, I can do as much as I can at the federal level, and I can be the biggest cheerleader, but we've got to execute at the local level. And, and that's been a place that has not happened, that I didn't see before. Like I, 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 both Democratic and Republican administrations, I never had the enthusiasm for growing business in Illinois and partnering with me for trying to bring businesses to Illinois the way I've had with JB. Now, maybe it's because JB is, is a businessman, but he has been all in on this. And when I've asked him to send uh, people from DCEO or you came uh, on some of these codels with me, uh, he sent them and it made all the difference in the world. I, I, I swear, this is how we got LG into Decatur, is we showed up and we showed up in, in, in a way that showed the flow for them that here I am at the federal level, you know, pushing the money down to the state and then the state shows up with state incentives and then we go down to even the DCEO and those lower levels within state government that we're gonna provide you with a full suite of what you need to do to get this factory up and going, this manufacturing facility, so that you'll make this you know, multi-billion dollar investment in Illinois. And, and, and that is so much better now than it was before. We still have a long way to go. Yeah. I think um, one of our weaknesses right now is we are so used to not being our own cheerleaders that we have to train, especially our municipalities, mm -hmm to be better cheerleaders for ourselves. And we also have to train, the fact that we never boast about all the engineers we graduate is a problem, right? This, this workforce is a big part of where companies decide to go. And then we're not, you know, we're graduating them, but we're sending them everywhere else. And we need to sort of boast, boast on that and say, come here, we can provide you with all the engineers, we can provide you with the resources. And, and, uh, but that partnership has been really good. Such a big point because companies are constantly looking for talent and now more than ever, it's hard to find it. When you have great universities that are producing that talent, you can say, look, the pipeline is right here. So that's, that's a great message. And our research centers, U of I's uh, 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 research center and the, and the incubators that are here um, one of the things that uh, LG said to us that, that was a consideration for them of where they go, what they said to me was, where, what is the proximity of an innovative incubator, that type of energy that's happening in a Silicon Valley? Do you have that in Illinois? And I, the fact that they had to ask me if we had it and he didn't already know about all, like MDX and our, 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 our manufacturing incubator mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, all of that, they didn't know. And I said, come to Illinois, I'm gonna show you around and show that there's both federal dollars in places like MDX, but then there's also innovative corporate, you know, uh, private sector money involved in that. Cause, and, and U of I's research center is really, really important as well. It's a big deal. Well, um, looking ahead, do you have any places you wanna to go to promote Illinois and American leadership next? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm gonna keep going back to Asia because we're gonna, again, this is relationship. Uh, I'm working really hard on Panasonic right now. Panasonic, um, every battery that they produce goes into a Tesla and they can't produce them quite fast enough because their batteries are certified green and qualify under the Inflation Reduction Act for the tax credits. Um, and uh, uh, Panasonic just did a groundbreaking in Kansas City for one new factory. And they're looking in the next 36 months for a new location for a second EV battery manufacturing plant. They can't do it in Asia, 
uh, and, and get the rare earth minerals from Indonesia because those rare earth minerals in Indonesia and, and, and I think the Philippines also are mined by Chinese owned firms or Chinese government connected firms using coal fired power plants. And so they would not qualify as green batteries for the American market. So they're looking to Canada for the rare earth minerals. And I sat down with the, um, right, uh, um, I had a meeting with um, Canada Pacific. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, by the way, the Panasonic CEO is coming through. He's going to Canada to, to some of your mines. What can you do to talk to me about, let's, let's, let's bump up that, that rail line that comes right into Rockford from Canada that, will, that can ship the rare earth minerals here. So we're working on Panasonic and Mitsubishi is looking to do a hydrogen power plant probably in Joliet. Um, they've got to be able to get some land given to them by the army. By the army, so I'm working on that. Um, uh, I'd like to go back to uh, other parts of Asia where we could do manufacturing there in, of American firms. Mitsubishi Logitech is in partnership with Caterpillar, and so they build some of the, this equipment in Malaysia. Um, so some of it will come back to the U.S. market. A lot of it overseas, but it's still American firms, American businesses. So. A lot in Asia. Um, in October, I'm going to um, Cardiff, Wales to look at offshore wind and uh, Romania because U of I is doing uh, some research there. Uh, they've committed to nuclear power in Romania. They're, they've committed to being, as a nation, to being 100% green. And they're developing the new small modular nuclear reactors. Um, and uh, uh, where do you want to put those? And they also use spent nuclear fuel. Where do you put a new small modular reactor? Well, in a place that already used to have nuclear. When, where, who has more nuclear reactors than anywhere else in the country? Illinois, we have 13. Um, and so I'm going to go learn a bit more about that to see if we can't get some investments in our energy sector and, um, and make us even more competitive in terms of uh, providing that carbon neutral and net carbon negative power to attract more businesses. It's such a distinguishing factor for us. So many companies are looking for that renewable, clean energy. So that's that's a big deal. I want to change subjects here. We have some questions from the audience. OK. Uh, and so I want to share uh, some of those. The first one from Cyrus Winnett. Uh, With the fiscal year coming to a close on September 30th, how confident are you that Congress will reach a compromise and avoid a government shutdown? I'm less confident now than I was at the beginning of the week. I, I hate to say it. Um, at the beginning of the week, I thought that we were not going to have a shutdown. Um, but in the last 24 hours, Speaker McCarthy has had two of his own bills that he had an agreement on within his own caucus taken down by the extremist far right. It's, it's a group of about five to seven um, far right Republican uh, uh, House members. Um, and they basically put the rug out from under him on two different deals that they had agreed to. And so um, he sent them all, he sent the house home. They were supposed to work through the weekend to, to come to some sort of an agreement to avoid a shutdown. And there was literally no, no, way, no way forward in it so that he actually sent the house home last night. So I am less sanguine. We're in mm. nine days away, eight days away from government shutdown. Um, you know. Unfortunately, I mean, I hope miracles happen, but unfortunately, I think we're headed for a shutdown. Now, the question is how long of a shutdown. I don't think it would be a very long one, simply because the Senate is united bipartisanly against a shutdown. I think at a certain point, Mitch McConnell is going to have to step in with Speaker McCarthy and, and, and do something there. Mm -hmm. um, but all the Republican senators that, well, the vast majority of the Republican senators, all the Democrats, none of us want the shutdown. So the, the Senate is working together and... and willing to come to some sort of a compromise. It's, it's, it's this seven people in the House. And the vast majority of Republicans in the House. I mean, where, where we are right now, Speak, Speaker McCarthy has to decide whether he still wants to go it alone with only Republican votes, because he doesn't have enough. Or at a certain point, he's going to have to do what Paul Ryan and Speaker Boehner did, which is put a bill on the floor to, keep, to open the government. Um, that will be a majority Democratic vote and, uh, and 20 Republican votes. That's how we stop government from shutting down, or that's how we reopen it. But if he does that, he loses his job as Speaker. That's the choice he's facing. Yeah. Well, that question may trump everything else here, but... Um... <laughs> 
let's, uh, let's bring two others in. These both are in regards to aviation. So this is a question yeah. from Jeffrey Miller and the next one from John uh, Diggles. Is there a foreseeable path? John's here? Where is he? Oh, there you are. <laughs> for the, is there a foreseeable path for the reauthorization of the FAA in the near future? And as chair of the Aviation Safety Operations and Innovation Subcommittee, can you please tell us uh, about your work, uh, about the work you're doing ahead of the holiday travel season. Okay. Um, so the FAA reauthorization bill is ready to go, uh, and it has a lot of really good things in it that will deal with a lot of the holiday season or future holiday seasons, which is it triples the funding uh, in the grant program for training air traffic controllers, pilots, and mechanics. One of the problems with the holiday travel season, why we see, you're seeing so many delays, is that we do not have enough air traffic controllers in this country. In fact, Midway needs, on a regular shift, at peak, uh, at peak times, they need eight air traffic controllers. They've operated with as little as four, mm -hmm. consistently. We've had, um, yeah. <laughs> when that happens, it slows down the number of aircraft they can handle. And so you get the delays. Um, but we've had a, an, accept, an unacceptably high number of near misses in this country um, this year alone, and, and it has been caught by the, by, for the most part by the pilots. Um, uh, and it's not that the air traffic controllers are making mistakes, it's that there are not enough air traffic controllers to keep a vis visibility on everything. So that, the FAA bill has a lot of really good stuff in it. It's dead in the water right now. We, we actually went to mark it up to vote it out of committee, um, uh, and it got stuck on two things, the 1500 hour rule, um, which is um, the, some of the regional airlines, to become a first officer on, an air, on a commercial aircraft and a commercial air carrier, if you didn't graduate from a military aviation, if you were not a military pilot, if you didn't graduate from a four year aviation college, or if you didn't graduate from a two year aviation program, you must have 1500 hours of flying time under your belt before you can become a first officer. And that was put into place after the Koken air crash because it was found that those pilots did not have enough training hours. Since this bill has been, since this law was put into effect after the Koken air disaster, we have not had a single fatality of a passenger in commercial aviation due to pilot error since then. There is a move to degrade that law because there's not enough pilots. And so some of the regional carriers say, hey, we need more pilots, just reduce the number of hours they need to have before they become a pilot. And Captain Sullenberger from Miracle on the Hudson, his response to that is, so you're saying if we have a doctor shortage, we're just gonna make medical school two years? Why would you do that with, with pilots? You wouldn't do that with doctors. Why would you do that with pilots? And so it's dead in the water right now. I thought we had a deal. And the deal was that I would, allow, I, I would support a raising of the pilot minimum age by five years. Um, uh, in order to keep the 1500 hour rule, um, but we're kind of, we're stuck right now. And it's, it's Senator Thune um, and Senator Sinema who are um, uh, uh, trying to degrade the number of pilot hours, it, flying hours experience. 1500 hours is not a lot of hours, guys, let me tell you. And, and you want the people in your cockpit to know what they're doing, to have not only just flown in a simulator or read about it in a book. Like you want somebody who's flown in icing conditions to understand, you, you want somebody who's flown in bad weather to understand what it's like, you know. Um, and so we'll, we'll see. I, I think we'll get it done by the end of the year, but there's still a lot of negotiating that has to happen. And then the other thing that's sticking point is um, they want to add more flight, direct flights out of um, National Airport to San Antonio because Ted Cruz wants to fly home from DCA. <laughs> and, and, um, and, but unfortunately, DCA is absolutely packed with the num absolute maximum number of flights can take off and land. It's only one runway. Um, and so there are folks who want to add more takeoffs and landings there, which can't happen. So I know we're coming down to uh, the end of our session, but... That was fast. Well, I, I got two more questions I want to ask you, and, and they come from some of the young audience members The most here. important members of the audience, so yes. I do want to make sure the first one is, how can people in Chicago help mm -hmm. stop littering and stop climate change? Oh, very good. Very good questions. Well, littering is on each one of us, right? Each one of us needs to stop littering, and each one of us needs to um, 
do everything we can to participate in recycling. And sometimes it's really easy to just do, you know, not recycle. Um, a lot of times, you know, people, so we have to do that ourselves, right? A lot of that is um, supporting. It's also um, uh, supporting the municipality, the city in the cleanup efforts. Uh, so investments in that part of, of, of the government. Um, and then uh, stop climate change. Well, do what we're doing, which is invest more money into green energy alternatives. The other thing that we can do is conservation of energy. Um, people talk a lot about coming up with new, greener, a greener future, but one of the things that we can do is cut down on our energy consumption. Um, and that's really important as well. So um, I hope some of you will become environmental scientists. That would be great and solve some problems for us. And maybe municipal leaders can work on the garbage problem too. <laughs> Thank you. One more question from our students. <clears throat> Will you run for president? Heck no. <laughs> no, why would I do that? If you're president, at most you can be in charge for eight years. You can be a senator for life. <laughs> you can like build up a body of work and, and, and make a difference. No, I'm, you know, I, I, I say that as a joke, but you can be in the Senate and build up a body of work over time. So, so much of the laws that I've passed, I've, I've come to learn it takes time. My breastfeeding legislation that puts all those breastfeeding pods in the airport, that took five years. That took five years. A lot of the stuff takes time. And so I would love to stay in the Senate and continue to serve the people mm -hmm. of Illinois as long as they're willing to let me. I'm not president. That brings this portion of the day to an end. Senator, thank you thank so much. You. Thank you. Oh, okay. Dan, I wasn't trying to, to stop you. I was just up here letting you guys talk. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the first thing that I want to say is the senator said it's not enough time. Well, I already know what Dan Gibbons is going to say, and we can probably all say it with him. Shall we try? More to come. <laughs> so that means you already have, and you know you have an open invitation to us. So um, thank you both so much. I think that you guys have both missed your calling. Um, you know, we do a lot of sales and financial services, and you two are like an awesome sales team. For them, <laughs> aren't they? Yeah. 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 Um, street food. Yes. Who doesn't love a good taco, right? Yeah, really. Right? I mean, really, who doesn't love a taco? Is there anybody who doesn't eat tacos? <laughs> See, not a hand went up. Um, what's the company that's like blowing $135 million a day? Who is that? Samsung in what? Texas. When, they, when the Texas grid went down, they lost $135 million a day in their plants in Texas. Who does that? I, I have to let that soak in. I have to make note of that for me. Um, so the military planes, that's pretty cool, right? Yeah. I mean, how many of you all have been in a military plane? I saw one hand up. Are you two? Are you guys military guys? Yeah, the veterans probably have. See, been. there's no. Some of them have been. How many veterans have been planes? in military planes? Okay, there's a whole bunch of you. Yeah, see? Some oh. of these guys were airborne and actually jumped out of them in the air, which see? makes no sense to me. <laughs> I haven't been in a military plane. Can I get in a military plane? You have to ask the governor. Okay. I'm going to ask JB. Yeah, ask JB um, to go up now. <laughs> Illinois Air National Guard. The C-130 unit out of uh, uh, Peoria is one of the best performing in the country. That's pretty cool. Like, has all the awards. Number one, number one unit um, of active or guard. Like, they're beating active duty Air Force units. I could totally nerd out on this stuff. That's like so cool, right? <laughs> um, I cannot thank, we cannot thank you both for being here enough. Um, Senator, yeah, you're coming back. I don't, Dan, I don't know what your plan is, but you yeah. know, <laughs> to get in the head of Dan Gibbons is, is, you know, literally, if you could like have like a brainwave thing, his brain never stops. It's constantly going. He and our staff work so hard to present programs like this, and we are so appreciative. Um, there's a whole bunch that I could say, but I'll get in trouble because we're trying to stay on time. Uh, I need to say, before I move further, that we have an upcoming program, the Chicago's Blueprint for Safe Schools on Thursday, September 28th, featuring the CPS uh, CEO, Pedro Martinez. So um, if you don't have your ticket, you probably need to do so quickly. Um, come early to secure a good seat, kind of like the inn, you know, no room in the inn, you know, with the, you guys didn't get that? 
It's Friday, I, I get it, I get it. Um, thank you so much to everyone that has been here. Uh, well, Dan, you don't get one, I guess. It's all right. It's all, it's all about the yeah. He has one already? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was going to say that to last, Dan. See, his brain never stops. This is Senator Duckworth's um, annual membership, but I thought we had one for Dan, too, but I guess you... You can come with me. I guess they'll let you in if you come with me. I am supposed to ask you, Senator, as a closing <laughs> uh, remark, and I don't know what your answer is going to be, but I'm told that I'll understand. Socks or Cubs? What is she doing? Oh. <laughs> guess where I'm going next. <laughs> My staff were like, how are we going to change from the City Club of Chicago to the Sox game? How are we going to change? I'm like, I got, I got this, just the suit to wear. Who wears a, who wears a Cubs t-shirt under a, a St. John fan. outfit? A Cubby. A Cubby who does it. Did you see me? I was like, what is she? Lorena, did you see me? I was like, what is she doing? A Cubby does it. That is classic. <laughs> got to be ready. And the Senate a just Cubby shirt yeah. under St. John. That's amazing to me. Well, the Senate did just remove their um, dress code. Yeah, we got to talk about <laughs> yeah, that Senate, more. Yeah, so I'm ready either way. To be continued. Yeah. <laughs> to as, be continued. as Dan was saying, we can all say it with him, more to, to come. More to come. Thank you all so much for being here. This was a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> The state of Illinois owes a debt of gratitude to both of you for the work that you're doing. And it's not lost on us. Thank um, you. The City Club membership, thank you, the, those who are members, and those of you who are guests as well, we hope you'll become members. Um, but the City Club uh, membership, as well as the state of Illinois, to the young people, I don't know what they're doing either. They're one, now, what are they getting ready for oh, photos? Anyway, see, they're smart. They want to be first in line for the pictures, right? Yeah, <laughs> they're so great. And the, one, of them, one of them just said, <laughs> like you missed it. Well, get in line, kids. We'll, we'll make sure that you, we've got some civil engineers and, and things in line there. Thank you all so much. Enjoy your weekend. And I guess go Cubbies. Is go Cubbies. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senator. Enjoy your afternoon. We are adjourned. <laughs>